Introduction to Representation Theory. In this series of talks, I want to present the basics of the representation theory for finite groups. So once we have it for finite groups, we can move the compact groups, then the compact Lie groups, and beyond. To start, we'll have G is a finite group. V is going to be a finite dimensional vector space over C. So we can identify V with CN. Then definition of a representation. So that's going to be a pair. Okay, we have pi is going to be a map. V is going to be our vector space. Pi is going to be a map from G into GLV. The general linear group on V. It's going to be the invertible linear transformations from V into itself. Once we pick a basis, we're really just talking about the invertible n by n matrices. And then this group we call GLNC. Now, for this map to be a representation, we have to have that pi is a homomorphism. So if we take any G1, G2 in our group, we apply pi to the product, it's going to give us the same answer as if we apply pi to each element and then multiply. So, Pi is just going to carry the group structure from G to the group structure of GLV or GLNC. Exercise, show that GLNC is a group. Okay, we need that if we're going to have a homomorphism. Now, another way to think of a representation, okay, we have a group. Okay, our group is going to act on a space. So a group representation is just going to be a group action on a vector space where the action is by linear transformations. So if you work it out, that's just going to be the statement here. So what are the advantages of studying representations? Okay, first, if pi is 1 to 1, in that case we have a faithful representation. Our group G is being identified with a subgroup of GLNC. So we're just looking at a group of matrices. Now, if I have a group that's non-commutative, Okay, that multiplication can be very complicated. But in this case, we'll have that the matrix multiplication catches all the non-commutativity. Another advantage, okay, if your pi is not one to one, not the worst thing in the world, it's still gonna allow us to use techniques of linear algebra to study G. Punchline for later, all finite groups are linear. So if we have a finite group, can always represent it as a group of invertible matrices. Now, let's take a look at some examples of representations. First example, the trivial representation. So G can be any group. Our vector space is going to be the complex numbers. So pi is going to carry our group to C star. For the trivial representation, pi is going to carry every group element to 1. So, for the homomorphism property, we'll have pi of a product g1, g2. It's going to go to 1 because pi carries anything to 1. Then if we split it up, we'll have 1 times 1 or 1. So this is a homomorphism, so we have a representation. As a group action, we have the trivial group action. So for any group element, it's just going to take any complex number, send it back to itself. Okay. Exercise, let pi v be any representation. We'll have pi on the identity element of the group, has to go to the identity matrix. Then show pi of g inverse, it's going to be equal to the inverse of the matrix pi g. Next example, so a little bit more interesting. We'll have our group is the symmetric group on three letters. So we're going to have permutations on the labels 1, 2, 3. Our vector space is going to be C3. Then we'll define pi 1 by carrying our group elements to each of the following matrices. So if I have standard basis E1, E2, and E3, we're just letting pi 1 on a permutation act by permuting on the labels. Once I have pi 1, I can define another representation pi 2. That'll just be the determinant of pi 1, and that's called a sign representation for S3. This is going to carry S3 to C star, and it'll be defined by, okay, the evens are going to get carried to 1, the odd permutations are going to get carried to minus 1. 
Now, exercise, verify one and two. Okay, over here, four pi one and pi two. Once you've done that, for pi one, verify the homomorphism property with the group elements one, two, and one, three. Let's take another look at pi one. We want to consider the following two subspaces of C3. We'll have V1 equals the span of 1, 1, 1. V2 is going to be equal to the subspace consisting of the vectors A, B, C, where A plus B plus C is equal to 0. Now, let's consider the group action on V1 and V2. The group action on C3 is just to permute the entries. So if we take 1, 1, 1, permute the entries, we're just going to get 1, 1, 1 back. So here, the group action is going to be trivial. For V2, take the group action, okay, it's going to permute the entries. That's not going to be trivial, but it's going to preserve the defining property. So if I permute the entries, take their sum, I'm still going to get zero. So in this case, the group action carries V2 back to itself. That's going to motivate our next definition. So I'll have a subspace V prime in V is invariant if, for all g in the group, pi of g carries v prime back into itself. Then we'll say that pi v prime is a sub-representation of pi v. So we have a representation inside of a larger representation. Now if we have any representation, we're going to have two invariant subspaces always. We'll have 0 and v itself. There are no other invariant subspaces we'll say that pi v is irreducible. Otherwise, it's reducible. Let's take another look at pi 1. So here, we're going to have v equal to c3. We can write that as a direct sum of v1 and v2. v1 and v2, we've already seen, are invariant. Now, for v1 and v2, those are going to be irreducible. So, for v1, we have dimension of v1 is 1, so if I want to step down in dimension, we go to 0. So there's no room for an invariant subspace between 0 and v. For v2, that's going to be an exercise. So we want to show that pi 1 v2 has no invariant one-dimensional subspaces. So once you show that, we'll have that v2 is irreducible. Now, we've written v as a direct sum of v1 and v2 where v1 and v2 are invariant subspaces. Let's see what we can get from this. So I'm going to choose bases for v1 and v2 as follows. So give me a basis for c3. Then we can consider our matrices pi 1g with respect to our new basis. They're going to be in the form. We'll have a 1 in the upper left-hand corner. We'll have a 2 by 2 block in the lower right-hand corner, and then zeros everywhere else. So our basis is going to put our matrices in block diagonal form simultaneously. This is something we want to generalize. Now, before we go to general finite G, let's first consider G finite abelian. We'll have a representation pi V, and then we're looking for a basis with two features. First, our basis is going to put our matrices in diagonal form simultaneously, and then those diagonal matrices are going to be unitary. Now, unitary just means if we take the matrix pi g, we multiply by pi g star, the conjugate transpose, out comes the identity matrix. If we have a unitary matrix that's also diagonal, then that's going to say our diagonal entries all lie in the unit circle. So in this case, we just have our entry times the conjugate of our entry is equal to 1. Now, First step to showing this result, exercise, we're going to have that pi of g to the kth power is equal to the matrix pi g raised to the kth power. Now, to make use of this, let's first consider the fact that g is finite. So we'll pick an element g. Since we're finite, g to some power, say n, is going to be equal to the identity. We apply pi to both sides, out comes the matrix pi g raised to the nth power is equal to the identity matrix. That means the minimal polynomial of the matrix pi g 
divides x to the n minus 1. Now, x to the n minus 1 has distinct roots. So we take the root of unity e to the 2 pi i divided by n. All the other roots are just going to be powers of that root. So that's going to mean our minimal polynomial for pi g is going to factor into linear factors. That's going to mean pi g is a diagonalizable matrix. OK, let's make use of the abelian property. So exercise, show that for g abelian, pi of g1 times pi of g2 equals pi of g2 times pi of g1. With that, the set of all of our pi g is going to be a set of commuting matrices. Since they're all diagonalizable, they're going to be simultaneously diagonalizable. Now, let's sum up what we have. So if g is finite abelian, okay, we have our finite dimensional representation, then there's going to be a basis that puts all of our matrices in diagonal form simultaneously. And then all of our diagonal entries are going to be roots of unity. So we're going to have a unitary matrix. Now, what do we want to generalize this to? So if I just have g finite, okay, we have our finite dimensional representation. We're looking for a basis that's going to put all of our matrices okay, into block diagonal form simultaneously. And we'll want that those blocks are all unitary. Now, what does our result about finite abelian groups say about invariant and irreducible subspaces? Consider our basis that puts our matrices in diagonal form. If we take any collection of those basis vectors, take their span, that gives us an invariant subspace. If we take any one basis vector, take its span, that gives us an irreducible subspace. Now, there might be others, but we need more theory to sort those out. In any event, the irreducibles are always going to be one-dimensional. Now, without the theory, we still have the following example. So I'll have g finite, v is going to be equal to c3. Then our representation is going to carry each group element to the 3 by 3 identity matrix. Then every subspace is invariant. Every one-dimensional subspace is irreducible. OK. Next, we have a definition. So we'll say pi v is fully reducible if we can write v as a direct sum, w1 through wk, where each wi is irreducible. So if I choose a basis for each wi, that's going to put our matrices in block diagonal form. Now, that's going to be half of the result that we want. So we're going to want when g is finite, okay, if I have a finite dimensional representation, there's going to be a basis that puts us in block diagonal form and such that the blocks are unitary. So if we can show full reducibility, we'll get block diagonal for free. Now, let's look at some examples. So first example, we'll have S3. Representation will be pi 1. We already saw that v is going to be equal to direct sum of v1 and v2. v1 and v2 are irreducible. So pi 1 is going to be fully reducible. Next example of g finite abelian. So we'll consider the basis that puts our matrices in diagonal form. Okay, Each basis vector, its span, it's going to be an irreducible representation. We take direct sum. We're going to get our v back. So in this case, fully reducible. Note by the example that we had, not necessarily unique. So we may get full reducibility by different choices of our w's. Now, as a final example, we want not fully reducible. So what's going to happen here? So we won't be able to use a finite group. I'm going to use instead the group R, the real numbers under addition. Vector space is going to be C2. My representation is going to take the real number x, send it to the matrix 1x01. So exercise, show that the only one-dimensional invariant subspaces are going to be the span of 1, 0. 
Now, because of that, you're not gonna be able to find another invariant one-dimensional subspace, so you won't be fully reducible.